Good day. I'm John Lunsman. For 30 years, I was the Director of Planning and Development for Chautauqua County. And during that 30 years, I fell in love with various parts of Chautauqua County. One of them is Chautauqua Lake. And I'd like to share with you over a series of presentations Chautauqua Lake in the past, Chautauqua Lake presently, and what we might anticipate for Chautauqua Lake in the future. Uh, in order to do that, we have to understand what we're talking about when we talk about Chautauqua Lake. We're not just talking about some 13,000 acres of surface water. We're talking about 180 and a half square miles of watershed. For Chautauqua Lake is what its watershed dictates it will be. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the past history of the lake. I'm going to attempt to have you come back with me a million years. I realize that's hard for any of us to uh, cope with. And we're also going to talk about a trillion pounds of water. So there are some things that we're going to have a difficult time grasping. I have that problem. But I think I understand the disciplines of these particular things. One of the challenges of Chautauqua Lake, and I'm going to start this one off with a rip snorter, is that uh, based on the way map makers have created the boundaries of the towns of Chautauqua Lake, a portion of Chautauqua Lake is in the town of Ellery, a portion is in North Harmony, a portion is in the town of Busti and Ellicott, as far as the lake itself is concerned, and it's bounded by the village of Celeron, Lakewood, Bemis Point, and Mayville. And the village of Mayville has a corporate area which extends out into the lake. On top of that, we have to deal with the town of Harmony, a portion of the town of uh, Sherman, a portion of the town of Portland, and a portion of the town of Stockton. So that when you begin to look at the lake, and then you understand overlaying that is the fact that the state of New York owns the bottom of the lake and has a series of rules and regulations dealing with our natural resources. Uh, so it becomes a very complex issue. But I wish to propose a question. If we look at the history of Chautauqua County, we find that Chautauqua County was incorporated, the total area of the county except for the Indian reservations was the town of Chautauqua in the county of Genesee uh, back before the turn of the century. In 1804, the town of Chautauqua was created covering what is now the boundaries of the county. In 1808, the county was split in half into the town of Pomfret and the town of Chautauqua. And the boundary of the town of Chautauqua and Pomfret cut the lake in this manner. This was Pomfret and all of the rest of this was in the town of Chautauqua. As we go through history, uh, we had the town of Ellery taken off, we had the town of Harmony taken off, which in 1917 and 18 became North Harmony and Harmony, and the town of Busti. And I have been researching the records, and at this point, I'm under the impression that when the town of Ellery was created, and the town of Busti was created, and the town of Harmony was created, that the legal description of those towns went to the shore of the lake. Not to the center of the lake, but to the shore of the lake. So I have the question that uh, our supervisor, uh, Jim Weidman, might be interested in cogitating, and that is, is all, most all of Chautauqua Lake still part of the town of Chautauqua? That's a conundrum that can float around for a while. We're going to look at nine different areas of discussion on the lake. We're going to start with the geology. There are three geology texts that are available, and you need to read them in an almost integrated manner. One, they were written in the early 1960s, a Muller, a Tesmer, and a Crane all either associated with the New York State Museum or with the U.S. Geological Survey were the authors of these documents. Muller and Tesmer deal with the history of the lake. Crane's work basically is a study of the groundwater resources of 
the Jamestown area, which because of the location of the lake, he included all of the, the, uh, the lake in that study. The uh, work is uh, interesting. It has some wonderful illustrations in it. We're going to look at, if I could take you back, let's say a million years, and we stood on the top of the schoolhouse hill in Mayville. What we may have seen a million years ago was a river running through a deeper valley than we know now and exiting to the north. Or possibly it exited in this manner. But when we look at the geology, and if any of you want to take a walk, walk along Lakeview Drive. Walk up Evans Street uh, and look at what is in the ditch. And you will find that in the ditch along here and up these two hills, we're looking at shale. So that when the glaciers did pass over, they passed over this hill and moved on. We'll look at the glacier movement, possibly three glacier movements that covered Chautauqua County. Uh, we'll look at the retreat of the glacier and what it left us. If you read Obed Edson, or again, the geologist that I mentioned to you, uh, we get references to a Chautauqua Lake that may have been 50 feet deeper, it may have been 30 feet deeper, it may have been 20 feet deeper than we know it today, depending upon what was happening some 10,000 to 16,000 years ago in the area. We'll take a look at North American occupation. We have information that suggests to us that people may have been in Chautauqua County as much as 10,000 years ago. Uh, this is evidenced by several Clovis points, which the archaeologists have uh, been given in many instances. We'll look at how people occupied the lake and the lake shore before European man came to the area. Uh, interestingly enough, that now becomes a very important factor in almost all decision making that we make in Chautauqua County when we are dealing with state or federal funds because we must draft an environmental impact statement and we must look at prehistorical activities and whether or not we are going to impact them. Uh, we'll look at the fact that if you are familiar with Dutch Hollow Creek and Sheldon Hall down in this area, that based on the early notes of a person that recorded things in the early 1800s by the name of Heath, uh, it could very well be that Dutch Hollow Creek exited at Point Stockholm instead of its present position. Looking at another document written by he Helen Ebersall dealing with the hotels around the lake, uh, we'll look at the fact that Mr. Sheldon brought 90,000 wagon loads of gravel into this area to make the property work the way the family wanted it to work about the turn of the century. We will also look at the outlet of the lake, because you can't talk about the lake without knowing what is, where the waters are growing, uh, the geology of that, the fact that the deepest point of the lake is here at about 75 to 77 feet, the fact of the size of this lake, the, there's almost equally divided, 56% of the surface area of the lake is here, and the remainder is down in the lower lake, uh, but 72% of the water of the lake resides in the upper lake. In a given year, under normal hydrological conditions, the water in the upper lake stays there 526 days. It stays in the lower lake 105 days. However, we have intruded on into that historic record. We will take a look at what Celeron's expedition in July of 1749 says about they're coming to the lake. Uh, they're staying here on the 24th, 23rd through the 26th of July. They try to make a trip down through the lake. And their problems of navigating part of the lake, what they see in the way of, of uh, native occupancy, uh, actually, they only saw some of the natives. They didn't make any real contact with them. Uh, the other problem is that Deceleron's notes were interpreted in 1878. And that person made some assumptions about what Celeron saw when he uh, came through the area. May I suggest to you 
that before European man uh, visited Chautauqua Lake, basically the landscape was one of mature forest. It had in it giant American chestnuts. It had pine and hemlock. Uh, it had oak. It had maple. All of those trees that you see today. We don't, of course, have the, the American chestnut anymore except as a brush plant. Uh, we also have an intruder into the area, which is the uh, black uh, locust, which came up off the lake plain as a uh, post tree. We will also look at the period of time when the Indians gave up their rights to Chautauqua Lake. I refer to it as the big drunk of big tree. And I don't know that that's respectful, uh, but the Indians were uh, given a rather interesting shuffle at that time. And following that and the clearing of the title and the transfer of the title to the Holland Land Company, by, 18, or by 1798, we began to see a fellow by the name of Ellicott and his crew um, surveying for the Holland Land Company. And they come into the area and they do voluminous notes. And unless you go read those notes, you can't appreciate what's in them. One of the things that intrigues me immensely is they describe a game fence in the Cass Run Valley uh, off the Conowango uh, by Ivory, New York, where their interpretation was that this game fence was built up and down the valley sides, and the Indians drove the game uh, to the game fence, and as they came through the openings in it, uh, they were able to harvest the game. Uh, there's a whole set of history that somebody ought to read and write about. I have to look at my outline. I have broken it up into the following areas. Geology, before local written history, which would go from 14 to 12,000 years before present to 1749, which is Celeron's uh, tour. It doesn't mean that there weren't Europeans here before. There were, because in, in one of the references of Celeron, they talk about the fact that a Frenchman guided them around the rapids and realized that uh, Jamestown's first name was the Rapids. Then we look from 1749 to 1860, and somebody might ask, why, John, would you use that as, as a reference break? Well, for two reasons. Uh, this is when European man begins to intrude into the watershed. And it takes us up to the time that the steam locomotive finally reaches the shores, or the railroads, reaches the shore communities of Chautauqua County. And of course, it's the beginning of the American uh, Civil War. And so that becomes a nice break point. Things dynamically change uh, after that. However, I would suggest to you that in that period of time, the Board of Supervisors of Chautauqua County uh, voted a resolution concerning the fact that there should be no netting in the waters of Chautauqua County. I believe that was about 1842. And in the 1850s, they passed a resolution that no one shall take fish through the ice from a certain date in February until ice out. And that anybody that would bring charges against somebody would get half of the fines that that person would be levied against them. And they would also uh, the other half of the fine would go to the town for bridge work. However, there was a very interesting little sub note here. If the person was found innocent, the person that made the accusation uh, would have to pay all the court costs. Uh, that's something we ought to think about may possibly in modern times. Then we will stop the historical presentation for a while, and we'll look at Chautauqua Lake as a hydrological system. And we'll look at what we've looked thought about, about the problem of flooding around the lake and how we are now handling uh, that situation. Realize that we're talking about a lake which back when Native Americans used it, I believe that the lake had an elevation of 1302 to 1304, which is four to six feet shallower than we see it today. Then we have a gentleman by the name of James Prendergast who comes along in 1811 and builds a dam. And it washes out the following winter. He ends up in court and pays a number of fines. 
And then in just in the blending of the end of World War I, we have a new dam built with three tainter gates. And those, that dam and those gates are replaced in the 1980s uh, to the present gate and dam system. And I would suggest to anybody that when you're in the city of Jamestown, go down to Friendly's Restaurant. This isn't a commercial for Friendly's, by the way. But go down to Friendly's and look upstream, and you're looking at Warner Dam. And you can go down, and you can walk both sides of the dam. Uh, realize that there were three dams, major dams on the lake uh, in that early period of time. The dam that Prendergast created was an over-the-top log stop dam with a series of channels running off of it uh, to various factories. We will look at Warren's history of Chautauqua County, which is nothing but a little book with a series of sketches in it. And he talks about the fact that uh, in 1823, they had to do some dredging in the upper lake because there was no water flowing down. And you begin to also understand, as you read Hazeltine's history of the town of Ellicott and several of the others, that people have totally misunderstood the hydraulics of not only Chautauqua Lake, but the uh, Casadega and the Conowango. And in misunderstanding these, they, they went into tremendous efforts to do certain things that didn't prove out very well. We'll look at the land use of Chautauqua Lake over time rather quickly in tiny, tiny vignettes. Uh, the best records we have are from 1938 to present, where we have aerial photography, uh, and we can really do a detailed study if we wanted to. But if you can imagine driving in the watershed of Chautauqua Lake today, when you look at a field in the watershed of the lake, realize that that field was not cleared with a bulldozer and a power saw or some other kind of mechanical device. It was cleared with brawn and hand saw and ox and horse. And think about the amount of energy that went into giving us the fields that we have today. And the fields that we have today are shrinking dynamically, particularly in the Chautauqua Lake watershed, as compared to what they were at the turn of the century. We look at the interplay of that and the hydrology of the lake. Uh, we have 42 inches of rain generally falling in the lake on average. What does that mean? That means over a trillion pounds of water. John, why do you bring up a trillion pounds of water? Because it's energy. And that energy does things to the lake. And it does things in the watershed. And it gives us different types of manifestations. And we'll look at that. We'll also look at the 1942 and the 1950 Corps of Engineers report, which gave us a wonderful scheme to prevent any more flooding on the lake. Uh, we'll also look at what we are now doing to minimize the flooding. Uh, because we did not implement the recommendations of the Corps of Engineers. The first recommendation by the Corps of Engineers was don't build in the normal floodplain of the lake. That's the least expensive thing that we could do. Well, we, we didn't stop people from building into the floodplain of the lake. Then we'll take the next section. We will look at Chautauqua Lake as a biological system. Uh, somebody's going to say, uh, come on, Mr. Lundsman, how can you be an authority on these things? I was responsible during the Joseph Gerasi administration and the John Glenzer administration um, as county executives of overseeing and seeing to it that proper work was done related to Chautauqua Lake. 1971 to 1978, we spent over a million and a quarter of dollars of county taxpayers' money, which attracted state and federal funds to do studies about the Chautauqua Lake is a biological system. It's called the Benchmark Series. Uh, we were deeply involved with the environmental impact statement of the bridge, which doesn't show on this map because of its date. Uh, we were deeply involved in the oil and gas industry and the drilling that was going on in the county. And we'll relate some of the things that are found there back to the original uh, geological information. We were also involved in, deeply involved, in the creation of sewer systems that serve from this area to here, and from Midway Point all the way down to here, and from approximately the South Boses all the way into Jamestown. And there's detailed uh, material available that tells us something about the lake that allows us to jump into the geological history and confirm it or 
illustrate some of the things that we've got to understand about the lake. When we get through with the biological study, which, by the way, the biological section will be based basically on a series of reports that were published by the county planning department and went through and became part of the state of New York aquatic vegetative management plan, uh, where we do a, have done a detailed investigation of the lake, its ethnic organs, and what is happening, and how we should handle the, the vegetation that is in the water that frustrates a lot of people. Other people will vigorously defend it. Uh, we came up with a plan that became part of a, a state document, along with its environmental impact statement. Uh, when John Glenzer gave me that assignment, I said, John, don't you realize that you have given me an absolute no, no, no win? Because no one is going to be happy with what the steering committees and the technical committee and uh, Mark Refrigette and Kelly Refrigette and I are going to come up with because it doesn't follow local feelings. The document is now in place. It's an important document. More people ought to know about it. We will then move back, and I'll flip us back into history, and we'll go into the, a very, very exciting time. From 1860 to World War I, and some of the best information on that period of time is to be found in a couple of references, and I'd like to show them to you. Uh, we have three publications done by the uh, Fenton Historical Society. I don't care in which manner that you read them, but they are absolutely intriguing. We have Chautauqua and Chautauqua Lake trolleys, Chautauqua Lake steamboats, and Chautauqua Lake hotels. These are tremendous Christmas gifts for people that would be interested and, and, and are intrigued by the history of the county. I recommend them to you highly. There are also several other books that are available, um, including our own uh, history of uh, Mayville by Devin Taylor. I recommend it highly to you. Uh, the problem is integrating all of the information that uh, is available in these documents. The, uh, if you can imagine 18 steamboats running up and down the lake, Hundreds and hundreds of rooms in hotels with no sewer systems. When you have 132 people in a hotel at the foot of Erie Street in Mayville in 1800s, what did they do with the waste? We'll talk about that for a moment. Um, we'll also talk about uh, coming up to World War I and the uh, change of the dam structure. We'll look at World War I to World War II, where all of a sudden the typical person of, of, of our society has more and more uh, time to, uh, for leisure activities. And we'll compare a 1904 map of the shores of Chautauqua Lake with this 1954 map. And then possibly I'll bring in some aerial photographs that were taken uh, this May so that you can see how things have changed even more. World War one to World War II is an intriguing time. And then we come to peace in our country, 1945 to present. And we'll look at the things that we have done in the politics of the lake. Again, there are a series of, of references, and sometime through the process, uh, I would hope that we'll be able to hold this up, and you can see the two sides of what I feel are not all of the reference material related to Chautauqua County, but the references that I basically will use uh, in this series of presentations. Then we're going to do the, the thing that I was paid to do. I was the director of planning and development for Chautauqua County. And if I had had a CB handle, I would have called myself the paid dreamer because it was my responsibility with the county planning board to encourage the county legislature to do certain things that relate to the future. And I'm going to contemplate and suggest to you what the future of Chautauqua Lake looks like and some of the disciplines that we're going to have to deal with if we want Chautauqua Lake uh, to be the, the most pleasant thing that it is. Realize that I refer to Chautauqua Lake as my lake. 
I would hope everybody that is in the watershed of Chautauqua Lake and has property on Chautauqua Lake would refer to Chautauqua Lake as their lake. It's my lake, it's our lake. We are responsible for Chautauqua Lake and what it's going to look like. We've done some interesting things. If you can imagine, we had in Mayville a, a wonderful milk plant that processed millions of gallons of milk over the years. But in 1976, it was estimated that the little inlet that served the milk plant and the highway department was producing 28% of the phosphorus loading that was going into the lake. 1976, for all practical purposes, the plant closed down, although it was opened a little bit later for a couple of years. But it closed down. And the next year, there was a dynamic change in the weed community in parts of Chautauqua Lake. And I documented those and sent them to the professors at the State University College at Fredonia as part of our benchmark series. Uh, we have a very important responsibility. Uh, Doug Conroe, past president of the Chautauqua Lake Association, a person that I have tremendous respect for, uh, was one of the counterparts that we were involved in when we did the aquatic vegetative management study. And he took a set of information that is available in the history and said, look, the lower lake is going to disappear in 792 years. Now, what relevance is that to us? It's very important. We ought to look at what Doug Conroe was emphasizing at that time. Because if the rate of siltation that he was using as his projection is the general rate of siltation, uh, is it something that we can do anything about? We'll look at the watershed effort that was launched in the early 1960s and see what the agricultural people say about Chautauqua Lake and whether or not we can create any type of a cost-benefit analysis in a watershed plan to stop the siltation into the lake and to stop uh, the nutrient loading in the lake. We'll even take a peek at the 1985 Agricultural Act, a federal act which you wouldn't think had any role to play in what is happening on Chautauqua Lake. But if you go out through the watershed, which I did two years ago with the final study that I participated in as a volunteer, you'll find that the number of fields and cows in Chautauqua Lakes watershed have changed dynamically. And when the nutrient budget study comes out, uh, I guess within the next year, uh, we may have some interesting additional information so that we can look at the future of Chautauqua Lake. Realize that there are a number of people that are interested in Chautauqua Lake, the Chautauqua Lake Association. These are the guys and the gals that have maintained the lake at least since the mid-1930s. And then we also have uh, the Chautauqua Lake Conservancy with uh, a group of people that are interested in the future of the lake, and we'll, we'll talk about them also. So I look forward to sharing with you uh, some knowledge that I have, and I hope that we can make it a enough interest to you that it'll excite you to become involved with Chautauqua Lake, our lake, my lake. Good day. This is the second in a series on Chautauqua Lake, past, present, and future. We're going to spend most of our time in this segment talking about the geology of the lake so that we can appreciate why it is the way it is and some of the disciplines of the geology that we should respect as we look at the lake today and as we look to the lake's future. We would start out by stretching your imagination. And this is a hard thing to do to go back one million years. And what I'd like you to do is go back one million years, and then let's walk to the top of the schoolhouse hill and look around and see what we see before us. As we stand on the top of the schoolhouse hill, it may be anywhere from 50 to 200 feet taller than it is today. John, where do you get that information? I reference for this presentation comes from the Muller and Tesmer New York State Science Museum bulletins 
that were published in 1963, and from uh, Leslie Crane's The Groundwater Resources of the Jamestown Area, published in 1966, along with a series of studies that were done by students and faculty of the State University College at Fredonia from 1972 uh, through 1978. There are also some historic documents. I may fall back and refer to Obed Edson uh, in some instances, for he has some geological uh, information based on his time and his interpretation. The geology of Chautauqua Lake starts with us standing on top of Schoolhouse Hill. We look to the north and we see woods. We look to the east and we see a valley, a wooded valley, possibly. The valley runs northward and it extends down some 17 to 18 miles. There's no Long Point Park Peninsula to disturb your view. You're looking down into the hills that are several feet, more than several feet, 40 to 200 feet, depending upon the interpretation, taller uh, than they are today. You're looking at the valley. As you look at the valley, you find that it's much deeper than it is today. I don't know if any of you have gone out into the area back of Hartfield, into the Hartfield Flats. Um, but there's been some borings done in that area and up toward Brockton, and it is suggested that that valley may have had a depth of uh, as much as 700 feet. Uh, as we turn around and look westerly, it may be that there is another valley that comes off and goes off in a westerly direction. Um, and uh, through the plateau. Realize that we're standing on the edge of the Allegheny Plateau. We're basically dealing with the bedrock of shale. Uh, now I've got to trick you because I put you there a million years ago. And now I want you to jumpstart you. Uh, I don't know where, but at some point, at some point, we're going to look at an ice sheet, and that's all we're going to see. In fact, we may have to be elevated several hundreds, maybe thousands of feet into the air to look at an ice sheet that completely covers the area. And if it's a very, very clear day and the ice sheet has a slope to it, we might note that the tiny southeast corner of the town of Carroll is not covered with any ice. Otherwise, all of Chautauqua County and into Warren County, six miles below Frewsburg, we're looking at an ice sheet. How many times this ice sheet moves back and forth? We're not absolutely sure. My information suggests that at least three, possibly four times. The evidence of the ice sheet, I would like to show you on the wall, uh, show you a map uh, from one of the Science Museum bulletins that, that shows the movement of the ice sheets. And then we'll come back and look at some of the evidence that we can see today if, if you're willing to get out and walk or row in a boat or walk around the shore of Chautauqua Lake as I have. So I'm going to move up here to the illustration on the wall. And here we have an Im uh, interpretation of the general flow lines as indicated by the topography that we have in Chautauqua County. And if you can see in enough detail, you can see that the last glacier basically moved across Chautauqua County in this type of direction. In different places, it has different cues to it. And if you're interested in this document, there may be several libraries that have it. However, as I have checked the, doc the libraries of Chautauqua County, very few of them have Tesmer or Muller's work. Uh, it also shows terminal moraines where the ice sheet in its various movements has progressed and then stopped and then retreated. And down here in the corner, you can see that this very small corner of the town of Carroll, you have a moraine that goes down through that area. And if you're interested in the exact location of that moraine, I would suggest that you go to uh, Carroll, go out Oak Hill Road, 
And where the radio tower is that the sheriff's department now has is a county park site. And that hill is part of the terminal moraine. The glaciers did not uh, proceed beyond that point. Other than that, the glaciers moved back and forth. We have a very interesting uh, moraine edge here. Uh, this is when we get Long Point State Park. Long Point State Park and Bemis Point are all part of a moraine system. One of the interesting things when we did the geological work uh, and the archaeological work, we found some wonderful things about uh, Bemis Point. Uh, Bemis Point is beautiful outwash gravel from one of the, the, the last uh, glacier that passed over the area. And it's anywhere from three to four to 15 feet thick. And after 15 feet, you get into organic silts. And it supports nothing. So you have this wonderful gravel base that is there. And the Indians, uh, whoop, I'm getting into another segment there. Uh, Bemis Point and Oriano Park are, are absolutely, or were absolutely loaded with uh, Indian uh, activity. And we'll get into that in another segment. As we look at the lake, I would encourage you to walk around the lake and look at different places so that you can see some of the geological marks. I'd like to take you to the uh, seven and a half minute quadrangle map uh, completed by the US Geological Survey, which by the way is available at our Cooperative Extension Center uh, in Jamestown. And you can buy your own seven and a half minute quadrangle maps. Realize that this composite map uh, is made up of a series of seven and a half minute quadrangles that have been pasted together and then I've done doodles on them. Uh, Lakeview Avenue in Mayview. Look at the uphill side of the ditch and you'll find that it's shale. Go up Evans or Wayland Street and look at the ditches. They are shale. If you come down to the lakefront in Mayville and walk up the lakefront, you will all of a sudden find that after you've gotten north of the railroad depot and north of Erie Street that the lake edge is shale. And as you get to Burden Tree Road, you find that you are now in gravels. If you go to the other side of the lake and go down right behind the Marmar restaurant, down into an area called Woodland, and you come up to my wife's grandparents' property, you will find a dynamic change that takes place in the lake shore. Our property has a muck, sand, gravel bottom, and all of a sudden you have shale. And you have shale as the lake edge all the way around to here, and then you find the shale again uh, appearing on this side of the lake. As the glaciers came and went, they lowered the elevation of the topography. Not only did they lower the elevation of the topography, they also carried with them a lot of material from Canada. And I think the best example of some of the material that they carried from Canada can be found in the bottom of Chautauqua Gorge. If you're willing to scramble down at the end of Lyons Road and walk north a little bit, there's a boulder about this big made out of Canadian Shield granite. And throughout the county, you find these boulders uh, deposited. As the glacier left, it gave us this terminal moraine feature here. Uh, it scoured parts of the lake shore. It lowered the elevation. And through the history of the movement of the glaciers, the valleys began to fill in. And as the valleys filled in, um, the first thing that we noticed is that there was a terminal moraine in the Jamestown area. And if you want a feeling of what a terminal moraine looks like, I would strongly encourage you on a beautiful fall day to drive through the Lakeview Cemetery in Jamestown. It not only is a peaceful and wonderful experience, but it gives you an idea of the rolling and the tumbling of a terminal moraine. The rest of Jamestown has been leveled out uh, tremendously as compared to what it was when the first European man arrived on the scene. In fact, if you want to have fun, uh, read Hazeltine's early history uh, of the town of Ellicott uh, and realize uh, some of the things that went on. And I'll, I'll refer to those in, in later segments. 
Uh, have you ever heard of caging? Uh, keep caging in your mind, because that's what they used to do with drunks in Jamestown. And we'll talk about caging in the 1800s. They had a real unique penalty for uh, people that were <clears throat> not sober in public. Uh, when we deal with the geology, we've got to understand that this was possibly the through valley route. Uh, I can remember in the early 1960s when there was still a railroad running through Mayville, going out in the fall of the year to pick up some uh, horn dice to do some live bait fishing for muscalonge on the lake. And as this railroad train went rumbling through here, I'm out approximately here at the end of this little road, and I'm on a bowl full of jelly. It's just moving like this. And the reason for it, we'll look at the geological history. What we have is those glaciers came and went was a deposition of material in several different layers. As an example, if you have a cottage at the outlet of the big inlet, there is no public water system there. But if you're willing to drill down to somewhere between 132 and 135 feet, voila, there's all the water you want in an area about this big. And a number of people have gotten to that uh, outwash of gravel and they're uh, getting their water supply from it. Evidence of what happened in the process of glaciation, the, the receding and the advancement of the uh, various ice sheets. We have a, a series of things, of course, that we can talk about. Many of you may have remembered the tragedy at the construction of the South Chautauqua Lake sewage plant. A man lost his life because they were using steel beams to support um, the construction of the plant. They originally did their interpretive work, and they decided that bedrock was at 65 feet on the west side of the site. And based on preliminary drilling on the other portions of the site, uh, they came to the conclusion that, uh, well, we've gone this far, and it's the same as this. Therefore, bedrock is at 65 feet. Well, it turned out that bedrock is not at 65 feet on the eastern edge of the site. They couldn't use pine poles to support the plant. They had to manufacture steel I-beams that went down, I believe, somewhere between 160, uh, about 160 feet to bedrock. Uh, so in several hundred feet, you had that type of a drop. So that's evidence of what that valley may have looked like uh, before glaciation. We have other evidence uh, in various parts of the watershed. Realize that as we put sewers, and this takes us up after World War II, uh, but as we put sewers around various parts of the lake, we had to do a series of uh, soil investigations to decide whether or not we could build a system, and if we were to build a system, what type of system we would build. Um, and it very much tells us about the movement of the glaciers in and out and the history of the lake. The first reference that I read to a history of the elevation of the lake uh, is in Obed Edson's piece of work, and I'm, I'm at this moment don't remember which reference that's in because not only does Obed do a piece, but he also uh, participates in several other historic documents. Uh, he suggests, based on his examination and another gentleman writing a, his master's thesis for Cornell, that maybe in parts of the Chautauqua Lake watershed, at some point, the lake elevation was 50 feet above what you and I know today. Uh, the other work by Crane, Tesmer, and Muller refer to elevations of 20 and 30 feet above what it is today. Some of the work that I did with the archaeologists when we were doing the cultural resource survey for the center in the south and the North Chautauqua Lake Sewer District suggests based on a village site above Fardink Road and another village site in the town of Ellery, which is buried under the construction of the Southern Tier Expressway, these village sites suggest uh, an elevation of a lake maybe 20 feet higher than we know it today. Uh, my information of recent times, when we begin to talk about European man coming to Chautauqua Lake, suggests that the lake may have been shallower than it is today. And we'll go into that detail when we get to that period of history that. Uh, we're going to be interested in discussing. It's 
a strange and challenging thing when you look at the lake and the soils maps, and I would suggest to all of you, I'm going to show you a document that becomes very important to anybody that is going to make any decisions about Chautauqua Lake, is that you get hold of this document, which I believe is in every library in the county, uh, or it may be available at the Ag Center uh, up at the airport. This document tells you what the top three feet of soil may be in an area in which you are going to work. It's accurate down to the um, about a two and a half acre uh, level of accuracy. It's extremely important. Uh, to give you an idea of why geology is important, in 1965-66, I had an opportunity to be away from Chautauqua County uh, for a year. And while I was away, there was an announcement that there was going to be a large development taking place uh, at the northern end of Chautauqua Lake, uh, up in the Hartfield Bay area. Oh, as we look at this map, I don't know if the detail is good enough. This map is based on 1954 information, and it doesn't show the completion of what is now known as Sea Lion Drive. Uh, over to the roads on each side of the uh, big inlet. Uh, so we have some historic glitches that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, but there was an announcement that there was going to be a, a tremendous condominium development, and there were going to be channels dug into this area. And I happened to come home every month for uh, two days at that time. And at the time, John Bertrand was the mayor, and I said, John, has anybody done any soil investigations? Have they done any boring information? Can they really build what they're going to, they're proposing to build in the big inlet? Are, will the soils really support what you're talking about? And he said, no, no one's done any boring. And I said, well, I think that you've got to do that. And of course, it was borne out when we finally went to the construction of the North Chautauqua Lake sewer system in the uh, 70s, uh, that we have a thin layer of wonderful Shenango gravels around this end of the lake that are very well drained. Uh, but in their being well drained, they're only well drained maybe this much, six feet. And once you get down below that six feet, you go into organic silts. And when they held the testing tools up, all they had to do was hold them up. They didn't even have to pound them. And they just slowly but surely sank down, down, and down. Uh, we never went as far down as we could go. I've already referred to you to the uh, 130 some odd feet for a, a lens of sharp gravel. When they were doing the investigation for the construction of the bridge across Chautauqua Lake, uh, they finally designed that bridge with friction pilings. Those pilings don't go down to bedrock. It was too expensive to go down to bedrock. What they've done is they've made the pilings big enough and boxed them in with enough concrete that the friction on the sides of them are what to support the bridge. It's not down to bedrock. Some of them on each side are to bedrock, but as you get out into the center of the lake, uh, we're dealing with an entirely different thing. So we're looking at a through valley that flowed north as the pre-runner, pre-glacial experience of this particular area. If we were to step over and go down to um, one of the hills in Jamestown, what used to be called the Roost, which is uh, now owned by Jamestown Audubon Society, and we were to look up the Casadega Valley, we would find that the Casadega Valley from the Casadega Lakes is flowing southward, and as it meets the river from uh, Warren area that is flowing northward, it turns and it flows northward and goes out uh, at uh, Cataraugus Creek at the northeastern corner of the county, uh, pre-glacial. The glaciers came along, they smushed, they moved, they changed elevation, and as they left, they left an interesting challenge. I've suggested in a view of a million years ago, let, let's take you back to the first retreat of the glacier, because we've got to understand the first retreat of the glacier to understand our estimates of siltation in the lake. When the glaciers first retreat, we've got bare land till exposed to the elements. And they've got to, we've got to have experienced extremely high rates of erosion 
uh, during that period of time. We've got to also have experienced uh, filling in of hundreds of feet into the valley. High rates of e erosion until we begin to get the plant transition which takes place in, in all instances if there's an, a, an appropriate climate. Uh, and finally, at some point in time, we reach a, a, a climax forest. Uh, the climax forest of the watershed uh, was dominated by maple, hickory, oak, American chestnut, hemlock, white pine, and it depends upon what side of the hill you're on as to which of these plants might be part of the dominant community. Uh, the total area. I would like to take you out into a woodlot and, and have you walk through the experience of what the first European man uh, might have seen, but we don't have a virgin forest in Chautauqua County. We have old forests in Chautauqua County, but not any virgin timber. Uh, but we're talking about trees, some of them, the, the pines, this big around, and we're talking about them going 200 feet in the air. All of them related to where they are located on the hillside and the type of soil that we're in. And if you want to understand the types of soil that we're dealing with, we're dealing with some soils that have a depth of only 18 inches. And then you get to a hard pan that doesn't transmit water very easily. In other areas, uh, we can have an all-day rain, at maybe two inches of rain a day, and the Shenango gravels are well drained, and the water just travels down through them and becomes part of the groundwater. We'll get more into the mechanics of the water and the annual precipitation uh, in a later presentation. Uh, but it's important to understand that the glaciers laid down a discipline for us that we ought to respect. And if we will respect it, um, we will avoid some problems. As an example, I have suggested that in the rural countryside in, in the Chautauqua Lake watershed, if you're not building in a municipality that has a municipal water supply, whatever it might be, uh, that people ought to build on a density of no less than an acre lot with a minimum dimension of the lot of 200 feet in order to keep wells far enough apart that you don't compete for the same uh, groundwater supply. This is one of those things that you should understand that is our geological heritage in terms of what Chautauqua Lake uh, and how it happened. The other thing that we're interested in is the potential. We've got to tell you that there are parts of the lake have shale bottoms, parts of the lake have muck bottoms, parts of the lake have what the divers told me in the 70s was suspended solids and these suspended solids might be three or four feet thick. When we did a series of borings in the bottom of the lake, one of the things I asked the investigation team to do was, could we find the ash industry as a uh, deposition in the sediments in the bottom of the lake? In other words, could we find that area when they were burning the majority of the trees and sending pearl ash out of Chautauqua County? And the answer came back, that the Bethnic organisms are so active that they've churned that type of information up and it's, and it's totally mixed. However, when we went to uh, doing some sampling in the crook of uh, the Long Point State Park, they literally lost the boring tool several times in this organic mass that, that's suspended down there. And they had a difficult time getting their boring tool back. The lake, I don't know that we're going to be able to do a good job today. Uh, with this illustration, I would hope to have a better illustration uh, later. Uh, we have a lake that shows evidence of uh, a long sloping plain here down to the deepest part off of Mission Meadows, which is 77 to 75 feet deep. Uh, and then we get a couple of more deep holes and we come around to Mid Lake 
and then we go into the lower lake. The maximum depth of the lower lake is 20 feet. Uh, then they throw some terms at us that are extremely interesting. They talk to us about Chautauqua Lake having an average depth of 35 feet, but a mean depth of 26 feet, which just boggles my mind because I have to adjust between average and mean. Then we have the lower lake, which has an average depth of 11 feet. John, what do those things mean? They are going to tell us something about our challenge as we deal with people that are frustrated with the weeds. I'm sorry, the aquatic vegetation uh, that grows in Chautauqua Lake, all part of our geological history. Uh, the lake is a discipline. If we will respect the disciplines that the lake gives us, we can have an enjoyable time with the lake. If we do not respect those disciplines, we have a difficult time. And the best thing I can do is for those people that have been on the lake for an extended period of time, realize that in 1934 or 35, the Board of Supervisors authorized their first funding to do something about the dangerous algae conditions on the lake. If you remember the summer of 88 and 89, uh, we had a weed growth in parts of the lake that just absolutely irritated a lot of people trying to use the lake. You couldn't leave shore in a sail, you couldn't leave shore in a sailboat and sail. You had to keep your centerboard out and you had to get out beyond the weeds. Part of this is the result of the geological history. Part of it is our contribution. As an example, it's construction of the Southern Tier Expressway. When the first parts of the Southern Tier Expressway were built in Chautauqua County, we were not very environmentally sensitive to the point that it, the county executive actually got funds appropriated to redredge some areas of the lake uh, because of the manner in which the construction took place. And we didn't discipline ourselves to stop the erosion. All of this in the final construction of the Southern Tier Expressway is now being considered. But we've got to look at and understand our geological history of how we came to where we are, and it is going to discipline us in the future. I would invite you to uh, the rest of the sessions. Our next session will deal with Chautauqua Lake and its history from 14,000 to 12,000 before present up to the year 19, uh, 1749 when Celeron came through the area. We look forward to the next session. Good day. This is another series on Chautauqua Lake, past, present, and future. Today we are going to struggle with that period from the year 14,000 to 12,000 before present up to the year 1749. The reason for picking these dates, somewhere between 12 and 14,000 years ago, the glaciers left the Chautauqua Lake Valley. And 1749 is the first detailed writing that we have about Chautauqua Lake. The writings come from an 1878 American history publication which interprets the work from the original papers of uh, Celeron's exploration of the area. Realize that uh, we have to really use our imagination to be involved with these time periods. Uh, I don't know, I have no, no, no comprehension of, of, of what I'm dealing with, but I'm sharing with you uh, something that I think is, is extremely exciting. And I would like to turn to the topo map uh, on the wall uh, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when we look at the year 14 or 12,000 before present. Here we have before us the watershed of Chautauqua Lake. We're dealing with an area within the black line of 180.5 square miles with a 13,000 acre lake lying in a valley um, the bottom of the watershed with the water flowing in this direction. 
realize that we don't have measurable flow. Uh, we can't really see it flowing, but we know it goes in that direction. As the glaciers retreated and left us basically the topography that we are dealing with today, because man has modified it in a very, very limited manner, uh, we have some interesting things. As the last glacier movement came along and plugged up the end of this valley, which may have been as much as 700 feet deeper than it is today, uh, it left us an interesting feature. Up in the town of Portland, and up through the town of Chautauqua, and around over past Summerdale, and over into the town of Sherman, we have a continental divide. It divides the water flowing northward into the Great Lakes, down the St. Lawrence, and into the Atlantic Ocean. Whereas if you get just south of Gravitz Apple Orchard, for those of us that have been along, around long enough to know that it was Gravitz Apple Orchard, uh, the water flows into Chautauqua Lake. Then interestingly enough, it flows into the Shattuckoin River, which then flows into the Casadega Creek, which flows into the Conowango Creek, into the Allegheny, to the Ohio, the Mississippi, and the Gulf of Mexico. So we have a spectacular thing here. We have a continental divide. However, it's not as spectacular as the one that we see in the West, and we haven't figured out how to develop it into uh, some type of a dynamic tourist attraction. There is no place along this line that any municipality has posted a sign to say, you are crossing a continental divide. What does it mean? It means all of the water this way goes one direction and all of the water that way goes in another direction. As we look at the history of the county or the history of northeastern United States, uh, I would refer you to uh, several other people in Chautauqua County for some of the details and some of the romance and some of the, the myths. Uh, I can't help but believe that uh, you have to, at some point, if you have the opportunity, listen to a presentation made by Norman Carlson. He has just done several presentations for the Fenton Historical Society. Uh, you've got to, to find Norton's notes on steamboating and fishing on Chautauqua Lake. Uh, very exciting. I believe there's a, a I'll, uh, at some other time I'll give you the proper title, but The Great White Ships of Chautauqua Lake, done by another author. Um, all kinds of wonderful things that, that we could get into. But I'm going to deal with prehistory. And, and the reason I mentioned Norman Carlson is because he has done an analysis of each one of the people that have ever drawn a map about Chautauqua County. And he's come to the conclusion as to whether or not that person was really in the county or not. I'm not going to get into that, that much of a detail because what I'm interested in in this series of presentations is Chautauqua Lake. And when is the first time we get information that is going to be of use to us uh, in understanding Chautauqua Lake? And we don't get any written history until the notes on Celeron's expedition in July of 1749. However, before that, the area was dynamically occupied. It was occupied by the Native Americans. We believe, based on archaeological work that has been done in the county, that man may have been wandering Chautauqua County as much as 10,000 years ago. There are several places in Chautauqua County where they have recovered Clovis points. These Clovis points are associated with the migration over the Bering Sea uh, from uh, Russia. We don't have anything, we don't have real good carbon dating, but I am willing to concede that it could very well be that we had people around the shores of Chautauqua Lake as much as 10,000 years ago. And these were very intelligent people. Uh, Professor White at the University of Buffalo suggested that any soils in Chautauqua County that are well drained and on a slope of less than 8% should be classified as archeologically sensitive. A high probability that 
Native Americans occupied and used the area. We find a number of recording opportunities. I don't have them in my bibliography. One of the things about archaeology in Chautauqua County, particularly that of more recent times, is the people that are involved in it guard it very, very jealously because there has been so much plundering of archaeological remains. And that's about the only way uh, to describe it. The other thing is that if you read an original source document, such as I did about burials that were opened in the vicinity of Sinclairville, they noted that one of the skeletons was of a person of over six feet in height. And by the time you get three references away, they talk about a, a tribe of giants that was, whose bodies were unearthed uh, in Sinclairville. So we have those types of things uh, to deal with when we, we go back into uh, prehistory, so to speak. We also have the story of the total elimination of a tribe of Indians that basically occupied most of Chautauqua County uh, sometime in prehistory. Um, there are at least two master's theses that have been written on that topic, and in both instances they claim that the Native Americans made these up to try and prevent the, the French and the English from occupying the area. That the Native Americans wanted to show that they were so fierce that European man oughtn't to come into the area. Now whether or not I have just created a new myth about Chautauqua County or not, I don't know. But take it as some reference material that is out there that deals with that particular topic. When we get into the work that was done uh, by the Rochester Institute and other of the amateur archaeologists of Chautauqua County, we such find some very interesting references. They talk about banks of Indian artifacts behind Dwitville. Uh, they talk about Indian village sites here and there. We don't have maps of those things because the people that are involved in it don't want to direct people to them uh, to disturb what might be there. Because as we learn more about how to do archaeological interpretation, we find that uh, such things as pollen and seed that are of these sites that a typical person rummaging through them wouldn't be sensitive to uh, might be important to help make the interpretation. To give you an idea of how the archaeologists feel about this in the construction of the Southern Tier Expressway through the town of Ellery in Chautauqua Lake, they literally marked out an Indian settlement site and said it's better off that we not salvage it, we'll bury it and record its dimensions and some other time someone with more sophisticated ability uh, can come back and, and look at this particular site. Let me take you to places that that you know about and that you walk on, though, uh, possibly, uh, and talk about Indian settlement. The shores of Chautauqua Lake have indications of occupation in many, many places. Bemis Point in Oriental Park. When we were doing the cultural resource source survey for the uh, center Chautauqua Lake sewer district, we did a dig right in the middle of the park to the west of the, and a little bit to the south of the uh, tennis courts and toward the casino. There are 32 inches of stratified Indian remains there. Basically the majority of them deal with the woodland period, which is a period that only extends back uh, several thousands of years. Uh, we were able to define this. It was a pottery site. We found 32 balls of clay with shells in them as a tempering agent. And apparently, they were going to make uh, pots out of them. We also found uh, drill bits, all types of points, a lot of firecracked rock, and a lot of broken pottery. We've never been able to do in the Bemis Point Park what we wanted to. But if we go back and look at the early notes, when Celeron comes through, the description is very brief. We don't cover but two pages in a document. And they talk about the struggle up the escarpment and sending the troops up to cut the Portage Road, which, by the way, becomes historically the, the first, uh, one of the first north-south roads of Chautauqua County from Westfield uh, up to the head of Chautauqua Lake. 
They talk about several days getting up that distance in the cutting of the road. Then they talk about a day trip coming down and someplace in this portion of the lake, we don't know where, uh, they say three miles above, uh, they spent the night. And then they traveled on down to the outlet, which they described as, remember it's July, very shallow, very difficult to navigate, trees and logs across an overtowering canopy of trees. And then they talk about the difficulty of going down through the rapids and how they portaged part of their cargo down around um, the rapids. What do they tell us about the lake? They tell us that basically, as far as they were concerned, the shoreline of the lake was totally forested. The Native Americans, they saw, they saw some canoes, but they didn't get into any personal contact with the Native Americans that were here. And that's it. That's all we know. And that's the first writing that I can find about the lake. But now let's go back and look at the archaeological work that's been done. One of the things that happened when we went to put together the North Chautauqua Lake Sewer District, which serves from this area here, Galloway Road, all the way around to the institution and then down to the Pendergast Fish Hatchery for the North Chautauqua Lake Sewer District. And then from Midway Park, all the way down the east side of the lake, down through here, and from Asheville Bay back to Celeron. In order for us to receive the federal grants, we had to do a cultural resource study, which meant that we had to hire archaeologists to go out, and look at the topography, and basically do an 18-inch dig shovel test every 100 feet along all of the li sewer lines that we were going to uh, install in order to find out if we were going to be involved with any prehistorical settlement. Uh, the other thing that happened, of course, is when people found out that we were involved in this, we began to get word of mouth stories. Um, some of my friends talk about when they were children uh, going up in the vicinity of the Lawndale Trailer Park, uh, just south of uh, Lighthouse Point, and when that was a field, uh, picking up uh, all kinds of Indian artifacts in that particular area. I have been told time and time again that somebody collected bushel baskets full of Indian artifacts and they have them at their house. Well, I went to some of the old families. Uh, one of them was the Hamming family at the end of Maple Drive East uh, because supposedly he had bushel baskets of, of material and he had nothing. The only place that I did find literally bushel baskets of material around the shores of Chautauqua Lake that I'm cognizant of was down on the Loomis farm uh, down on Goose Creek, and I'll show you where that is on this map. Uh, we're dealing with this area of the lake, and the, this is the Loomis farm, and a very interesting piece of land use. I could do a whole presentation on the Stan Loomis uh, development at the mouth of Goose Creek. Uh, they literally had mortars and pestles and all types of uh, Indian artifacts. The fact is that when we put the sewer line through this particular area, or we designed to put it through, one archaeological team felt that the garden across from Stan Loomis's house ought to be on the National Register of Historic Places, i.e., uh, you cannot put your sewer line through there. Uh, we didn't work with that archaeologist for too long. Uh, eventually we brought in another archaeological team and they said the work that the first team had done had salvaged that whole particular site. Uh, the second team identified the uh, activity at Bemis Point and, and I dug with those people for several days on my hands and knees uh, with a trowel and a brush and a pick uh, finding the things that were there. Uh, they proposed this for nomination to the historical register uh, at the time that the historical register process was taking place in Washington, the head of the first team was the chief uh, person deciding whether or not uh, a 
site should be registered, and they said, uh, we're sorry, but that's, that's not a significant site. So we, even in archaeology, we have the, the problem of politics. But we do have a, a record uh, of the earlier settlers talking about a plum tree orchard back in through here, a burial ground, and a tremendous number of Indian, uh, amount of Indian evidence. One of the other things is when we look at Heath's notes, uh, these are basically up in the McClurg Library uh, in Westfield. Uh, we find that when he draws the area of uh, Dutch Hollow Creek and the Sheldon Hall area and Point Stockholm, he doesn't have uh, Dutch Hollow Creek going straight out into the lake. He has it bending over and coming out at Point Stockholm. And he illustrates all of the rest of the area there as being Indian fields, that there was still evidence when he arrived uh, that they were raising uh, corn, they were raising squash and, and other plants uh, as a cultivating activity, which is contrary to what Celeron talked about, because Celeron talked about the fact that it was forested down to the shoreline. Well, it very well may be that as they were plying the lake and dealing with their canoes, they really didn't have the opportunity to look deeply in back of the, maybe the first row of trees. Uh, I would suggest to you, if you want an inter interesting uh, comparison, there are a number of historical texts, and I just came upon a, a text uh, a photo of artistic renderings uh, called Early Chautauqua, and it shows the hills of Chautauqua Lake basically barren, and we'll talk more about that uh, at, at another time. Uh, in the session where we, we go into what happens when European man uh, comes to the area. Uh, Tom's Point, even today, if you want to go out there after they plow the field of Tom's Point, uh, you can find artifacts. Art Thomas and his boys, Art Thomas was the uh, town justice, may still be the town justice of North Harmony. Uh, he and his sons collected a, a substantial number of artifacts in this particular area. Uh, there's almost no place in the lower lake where you have well-drained soils that you are not dealing with the probability that you're dealing with a place where early Americans uh, were involved with uh, the waters of Chautauqua Lake. If you begin to read Hazeltine and the history of Chautauqua County, he refers to burial grounds on the south side of the Chattacoin River. But he, uh, it's an offhanded reference. Uh, I have no doubt that when you get down into the moraine area uh, at the lower end of the lake where it was well drained, uh, that the Indians used it. Uh, there are a number of other places that I've encountered uh, archaeological evidence of occupancy. Uh, I'm involved with the Jamestown Audubon, and uh, it just so happens to the east of that site is where two of the Clovis points which would indicate the earliest occupation uh, were found. The uh, period of time, 1600s, as I say, go to Norman Carlson. Don't, don't use me for reference. Uh, we have trappers. We have hunters. We have military expeditions that come through for a moment. But the first thing that I have found to date in writing is the account of July 23rd, 24th, 25th, as they traverse Chautauqua Lake. I thought maybe, maybe they'd tell us about Potomagee and Crispus or Curly Leaf Pondweed <laughs> or something like that. But they tell us nothing about, uh, other than the fact that the hillsides were totally forested as far as their interpretation was concerned, and uh, that there's, uh, contact with the Native Americans, and, and that's about it. As we have a hint, uh, and I tried to get uh, Mike Wilson from the College of Fredonia with me this spring to go up and look in the vicinity of uh, the upper reaches of Chautauqua Creek at what I felt were interglacial trees. Uh, that were laid down in the gravel uh, and, and then another glacier came along, or grew, and then were laid down by another glacier coming over them. 
However, when I went out to explore it before I invited Mike to come up and make his interpretation, uh, a beaver went in and built a dam, and I have eight feet of water sitting on top of what I would consider my intercessional uh, tree grow. Realize that uh, when we are here and they are going down through the lake, I've got to jump all the way forward for a moment and tell you about the uh, floodplain documents that are part of the uh, Federal Flood Insurance Act of 1969. For in that document for the city of Jamestown, they have done a profile at the bottom of the outlet of the lake. And they show the profile from Dunham Avenue and Celeron all the way down past uh, Main Street in uh, Faulkner. The outlet of the lake drops about 53 feet through that area. And based on material and information that I have, I go back and look at the Warren report, or the Warren his sketches of Chautauqua County, published in 1864, 1846. I've got a blank there for a moment. Uh, they talk about one year the lake was so dry in 1823 that they decided to dig the outlet deeper so that they could get water flowing to the mills that were along the outlet of the lake, and they encountered shale. Well, I can show you that shale above the Third Street Bridge at an elevation of 1,302.5 feet above mean sea level. Uh, that was a ledge, and it's still there. The uh, Warner Dam is built downstream of that particular manifestation. So I would suggest to you that the Native Americans and Celeron, when they came, where, when the Celeron met the Native Americans in 1849, that Chautauqua Lake had a mean elevation of somewhere between 13.25 and 1,304 uh, feet above mean sea level. In other words, somewhere between four and six feet shallower than you and I know it. If we can imagine four to six feet shallower than you and I know it today, all of a sudden, many of the areas that are wetlands around the shores of the lake, even today, become dry land because of the change in elevation. And therefore, uh, I can uh, agree much more with the interpretation of uh, what the archaeologists have given us. Realize that the archaeologists also suggest to us that on the Far Fardink Road, uh, in the town of North Harmony. Above it is an Indian site. Um, another site uh, with the construction of the Southern Tier Expressway suggests that these village sites were established with a lake elevation that may have been 20 or 30 feet higher uh, than the elevation that we're looking at today. So we have that type of uh, flow and conjecture uh, dealing with that type of thing, and it'll take more more sophisticated work than we've been able to put into it if we haven't destroyed too much of the evidence uh, to this date uh, in order to make that uh, work out much better. When the archaeologists were doing the work coming down off of Midway Park, um, they walked the dirt paths of Midway Park and picked up artifacts in the, in the paths. They didn't have to dig them. Uh, Stan Lance, who was a native of Chautauqua County and did much of the work for the Mellon Museum, said, look at this, I've got Lamokin, I've got Lamokin um, polished stoneware, and it's lying right in the path up to the, to the go-kart area. Uh, and no one, no one is interested in it. And, and it was uh, quite interesting. I was digging with Stan and others down here, and I was throwing stuff out of the pit, and I picked up a stone that, to me, was nothing. And I had it about there, and Stan grabbed it out of my hand. He says, that's a blank. He says, that's a, that's, a, that's a piece of stone that has been carried around to be made into an instrument. I said, all right, I'll believe you, Stan. So we have that history throughout. There are other histories to deal with, uh, but they're not well written. They're not specifically tied to Chautauqua County. Uh, they're not integrated well enough so that I can do anything with them. One of the things that we might look at to know more about Indian occupancy is to look at the original notes of the Holland Land Company. A copy of the set of the original notes of the Holland Land Company 
are in the county clerk's office in Mayville. Um, you would have to train yourself to be able to read them, but they have detailed notes on the soils, the vegetation, uh, Indian trails, and anything else that might be of interest uh, to the Holland Land Company um, as they were promoting. Now realize when I talk about the Holland Land Company, I've, I've jumped forward from 1874 to almost 1900. So we're gonna, we'll go into that uh, at a later time. Uh, suffice to say uh, that the lake has been a human resource for at least 10,000 years. Uh, it's up to us to decide what the future of the lake is going to be in the next 200, 300, or 400 years. We mistreated it for a while until we understood uh, what was going on, and we'll get into that in a later time when we talk about the uh, lake as a hydrological system, and then as we talk about the lake as a biological system. Two more minutes, oh boy. <laughs> uh, Let's talk a moment about the weather of Chautauqua County. One of the things that you've got to understand is the influence of weather. And what we're dealing with here is the idea of how much precipitation we get uh, annually. Based on some studies that I've personally done, we get 42 inches of rain on average in the watershed. And we're going to discuss later on what 42 inches of rain mean. But realize, we're talking about this much rain on every square foot of the watershed. And that has an impact on the watershed. We'll also look at the fact that the watershed of Chautauqua Lake has eight acres of watershed for every acre of surface area. If we look at the Great Lakes, they have two and a half acres to three acres for every acre of surface area. The implication, we'll get into that in, in greater detail. But it plays an important role in what happens in the lake itself. The population of the lake went from roaming Indians of several centuries ago that came and used their village sites until the soil was exhausted, and then they would move to another site, to permanent settlements where on a Saturday night we may have 10,000 people. At Chautauqua Institution. We have some 1,600 people living here in Mayville on a year-round basis. What is their impact on the lake? Is it good? Is it bad? Can we ignore it? We'll talk about those things in several of the future presentations. Good day. This is another session on Chautauqua Lake, past, present, and future. Uh, we're going to delve into the past of the lake for a few minutes. We're dealing with the period of time from 1749 to 1860. Somebody's going to say, John, why did you pick such a date spread? This is the time from the first written record that we have of the lake up until the time that things all of a sudden start becoming very, very exciting. All of the intervening years are exciting. But 1860 is the beginning of the Civil War. 1860 is the beginning of trains coming to the Chautauqua Lake watershed, even though we had trains in uh, Dunkirk in 1850s. Uh, and it's beginning to open up Chautauqua Lake and change its character. So from 1749, which is our first record, which was done by the French explorers, uh, the Celeron, as they came through to go to Pittsburgh, as they were uh, flexing their muscle uh, against the British, and the Indians were playing games in between them. Uh, we noted that the uh, only comments that they made about the lake was that it was forested all the way around, and that they had a difficult time getting down the Shattuckoin, and then a earlier hunter explorer or trapper explorer had led them through a portage around the rapids, which was the first name of the city of Jamestown. Uh, after that, we don't see anything happening 
uh, that civilians get excited about, but we have a number of military expeditions that play games and that people are still searching for cannons lying someplace possibly around the shores of the lake. They're still seeking uh, Celeron's tablet that was supposedly buried at the foot of the lake, but we've not been able to find uh, those particular items. Uh, this is basically from 1849 uh, until uh, about 1797 is basically trapper country and American Indian country, except for military expeditions. And so the Indians continued to live here. The American, I should say the Native Americans continued to live here, uh, what there was of them. Uh, they continued to have villages. They continued to bury their dead in their cemeteries, all of which I must admit we have desecrated, which is disconcerting to me, to say the least. Uh, and we don't begin to see anything until we get a gentleman by the name of Ellicott working for the Holland Land Company, and he and his crew come blustering out through the woods, putting out township lines and range lines and surveying and taking notes of what the quality of the land is uh, for the Holland Land Company. Because the Holland Land Company, in its selling of land, kept the best land until last. They didn't give away the best or sell the best land right off. Uh, the first settlement that we know of is, and real activity that takes place in the, uh, near the watershed of Chautauqua Lake is in Kennedy uh, with the opening of a sawmill to move pine uh, down the uh, Conowango to the Allegheny and then on down into more civilized parts of Pennsylvania. Chautauqua Lake itself, uh, a fishery for the natives, a fishery for the people that came here, but there is a lot of record in the, in the history books about the people coming and uh, scraping out an existence. Uh, in some instances, they settled where the Indian villages were, and I'd like to point those out to you a little bit on the map over here, if I might. Um, actually, we have Indian settlement all the way around the shores of Chautauqua Lake, but the most intense Indian remains that we know about are in this portion of the lake. And for years, I looked for something called bushels of arrowheads and Indian artifacts. And finally, at the Stan Loomis farm at Goose Creek, I did finally see bushel baskets of Indian artifacts that uh, had been collected by the Loomis family. The Loomis family having owned the farm since they purchased it uh, from the Holland Land Company. The only traffic that took place or activity that took place on the lake was that in the early history, the only road was the portage up from the Lake Erie Road, and then products were carried down through the river, down on a portage around the rapids, and then carried down into, quote, civilized Pennsylvania. 1811, we have a gentleman coming through the area. I shouldn't say coming through because he's been through with his family before and they've decided to settle here. His name was James Pendergast, and he decided to build a dam on the outlet of the lake. Product is moving down the lake during the seasons that it's allowed, but the dam is built in 1811. And that year, Mr. Pendergast floods out all of the farming activity around the shores of Chautauqua Lake. The following fall, the weather is so bad, the dam is taken out by the weather. But the following spring, Mr. Pendergast not only pays recompense to all of the farmers' crops that he uh, flooded, uh, but he's also fined, one of the earlier court records find Mr. Pendergast being fined uh, $15 for uh, the actions uh, that he had taken at that time. The dam is rebuilt. If you want to read details, probably the best details you're going to find are in Hazeltine's uh, History of the Town of Ellicott and other comments that are in that document. The United States, for it now exists as the United States, is a very much in its infancy, and they're very much interested in trying to connect the Great Lakes and the navigation of the Great Lakes with the navigation of the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley system. 
Um, in some instances, we have a company that looks at building a, a channel up the, the Casadego or the Conowango. They look at this, and they go over and they look at Presque Isle, and finally Presque Isle becomes uh, more advantageous along with the river and, and stream system that is there. But a tremendous amount of product does move by boat. Realize that when we're talking about this period of time, what they have for transportation, they have wagons, they have skid systems, and they have boat or water power or water transportation. Otherwise, it is all done by Shanks Mare. In other words, people are walking. And you find a number of interesting stories of people wandering among, uh, about in the Chautauqua Lake watershed. The dam is put in place, and the people begin to produce product from it. And it isn't very long before they realize that the water supply of the whole basin is not enough to run the mills on a year-round basis. In fact, if you look at some of the older maps of the county of Chautauqua, you'll find that there are mills spotted throughout the Chautauqua Lake watershed. In fact, the, uh, in building the first courthouse, the uh, Lumber was cut down off of Goose Creek and then brought up Lake uh, to build the first courthouse for Chautauqua County. The people are clearing land. They are taking the, la the wood that cannot be floated down and cannot be, is light enough to be floated downstream uh, to other places in exchange for goods and services. They're taking it and burning it and making it into ash, leaching the ash and moving pearl ash uh, down river. The people of Chautauqua Lake are building keel boats up in Mayville to move product. Some of the product is coming up off of the Erie Trail and coming down on the, on the lake and then on down to uh, Pittsburgh and other places south. In the notes, it's almost an offhand statement, but they talk about the fact that the President of the United States insists that the five locks that it allow navigation down the Shattercoin River be kept in operation. I have searched, not as much as I want to, but I have searched for some detailed information on the five locks, and I have as yet not been able to find it. There's one other thing that I haven't been able to find, and I ask you people to help me. And I plead almost. If you have a picture of Warner Dam, that was taken before the turn of the century, or all the way up until 1915, from the downstream side, would you share it with me? I have looked through the Fenton collection, I've looked through several connect collections, but I don't have a picture of the downstream side of Warner Dam as it existed before 1915. My understanding is that it is a combination of log and earth fill and then you've got channels around it that go to the various uh, sawmills or mills of, uh, for grinding grain. And also, we also have this question of the five locks that allows navigation to take place from products moving down into the Ohio River uh, Basin. I think that's enough looking at this map for a moment. I go back and sit down and rattle on. Some of the exciting things that happen and some of the things that you catch on to as you're reading the history of the county uh, deal with such things as when should elections be held? And in the early history of Chautauqua County, they moved the elections for town government late in the year, May, June, because they, everybody was downriver. Everybody had taken their, their raft of lumber or their keelboat downriver. And of course, in the vast majority of instances, they walked back, although there was some poling of keelboats coming back upstream. And in some instances along the uh, waterways, apparently there were towpaths where the keelboats could be towed. However, a typical keelboat coming back, uh, depending upon what year you read your reference, may have offloaded at Fentonville. Or they may have, if there was enough water in the streams, they may have gotten up as far as Slippery Rock. Oh, where's Slippery Rock? Slippery Rock is, is uh, where Buffalo Street crosses the Shattercoin River in the city of Jamestown. 
Uh, that was one of the manifestation areas of uh, the rapids that uh, the city was named for uh, originally. The uh, people basically, well, I'll give you an idea. There was a bounty of $50 for an adult wolf because almost everybody made their own clothing. They had their own flock of sheep, and wolves were ravaging the, uh, the sheep at different times of the year. So you had all kinds of strange and difficult uh, things going on. 1842 is another niche. We, we see early on the, the changing of the date for elections. Uh, and then in 1842, they county, because there was no state fish and game rules and regulations, passed an ordinance stating that there could be no nets or seines uh, used on the lake any longer, that the people had recognized the uh, resources as, as being important enough that they had to stop whatever was going on. And I would imagine there was, there was something terrible going on for them to be able to bring that issue to the Board of Supervisors and, and get a, a, uh, an ordinance passed. Realize that the Board of Supervisors only met for several days in in either October, November, or November, December each year. They didn't meet as they do now uh, twice a month. 1852 is another benchmark dealing with the lake. 1852, an ordinance is passed by the county, or a law, I'm not sure which term I should use there, stating that from a certain date in February on, you could no longer fish through the ice on the lake, again, to attempt to protect the resources. The interesting thing about that particular law was that half of any fine that was uh, collected uh, would go to the person that turned the person in that was violating the law. And the other half would go to the town government in which the case was tried to be used for building bridges. However, there was an interesting hook on the end of that particular law. If the person was found innocent, the person that did the accusing had to pay all the court costs. Uh, I wonder what would happen if we were to apply that to, to today. Uh, 1860, we, we have a thriving industry in Chautauqua County. Uh, we're making all kinds of farm implements and tools. Uh, during the winter months, they're put on uh, keel boats, uh, preparing for the spring freshet. And we'll talk about the spring freshet and the hydraulics of the lake in, in another presentation. In fact, we're going to break at the end of this one in terms of history. And, and go look at the lake as a hydrological system because it plays a very important role in what goes on. But it wasn't long before the mills, the sawmills or the grain mills, all had steam engines associated with them because they found that the waters of the lake and its watershed did not supply enough water on a year-round basis to do the type of milling that they wanted to do. Uh, in fact, there is a, a note in Warren's history that states in 1823 that the lake had gone almost dry that year and they had tried to open the, the outlet wider and deeper in order to get water to go down the river. And what they found was that they struck a shale and in this shale they found holes in the shale that indicated that at some time somebody had apparently put posts across the uh, outlet in order to impede the flow uh, uh, for some navigational purposes. And it very well could have been a military expedition that, that uh, did that. But that was 1823 that they really began to recognize that the lake in and of itself, uh, they would like to do something. There were several instances where they created companies to expand uh, the outlet of the lake all the way down to Main Street uh, in Jamestown, uh, but those companies never really got into to doing the work that had to be done. Oh, one other thing that I, I, I find of interest. <coughs> People that were found drunk on the streets of Jamestown were caged. Uh, that sounds interesting, but what you didn't understand was that the cage was put over the side of the Main Street Bridge and they were dipped in the Shattercoin River as part of their punishment for uh, public drunkenness. Uh, I wonder if that would help today in some instances. The lake by this time is recognized as having an elevation of 1,308 feet above mean sea level, which is the elevation that we know it as. 
We are also beginning to see the first steamers uh, going up and down the lake. The first boats that we hear about are the horsepower devices that don't do too well. And then we have a small boat that comes on in the 1820s and begins to ply the lake from one end to the other. But we don't have any hotel or any motel industry to amount to much. We have one inn at Flavana, uh, and that's, that's all that is taking place on the lake in terms of recreation. And that's my, my sense of what I have read is it was a big game club, and uh, it really wasn't a family endeavor originally, uh, but rather it was a place for the boys uh, to come and have a, a, a wonderful fall experience with whatever hunting season was on at that particular time. The, uh, the extent of what is happening around the lake all during this time is that they are clearing the woods. They are clearing the woods. They are taking the woods off. Anything that is floatable is going downstream to be exchanged for either goods or for cold cash. Uh, I don't think that we have any appreciation of, of this clearing process that took place. You realize that it was done with oxen and with horses and the sawing was done with, with hand power and back and sweat. Uh, it was not done with a power saw as you and I zip through an 18-inch tree and think nothing of it. Uh, and basically, when I look at all of the old sketches, for there are no photos, uh, all of the old sketches, whether the artist was tired or not, I don't know. But when I see so many repetitious drawings of the hills around the lake being almost bare of timber, or a couple of trees on a ridge, I cannot help but feel that a tremendous amount of energy goes into this period of time. By 1840, uh, one of the historians suggests to us that all of the commercial pine that could be harvested had been harvested from Chautauqua County. Realize that we had other, other woods or other trees in the woods than we have today. We had the American chestnut. Um, that we don't have it at all except now as a shrub uh, that was a wonderful tree and that it was uh, it had the ability to be used for a number of things and it decayed very very slowly um, I'm told of sassafras trees that may have gone as much as 24 or 30 inches in across diameter uh, we only see sassafras as a shrub in Chautauqua County today um, cucumber trees that we we see uh, some of them are being harvested at a rather reasonable size now, but these were the trees that were used for the barns of the county. Um, those trees that wouldn't float, they burn. And I asked when we were doing some investigations of Chautauqua Lake if whether or not the uh, scientists that were doing the core borings of the lake could find the pearl ash industry for me in the sediments of Chautauqua Lake because I thought that would be real interesting to see if, if there was that evidence of that tremendous amount of uh, fire that took place and the amount of uh, conflagration that there was. And what I found was that the Bethnic organisms of the lake are so busy churning things up that they were not able to identify that particular uh, time in our history. We can identify other th times in our history that I'll mention later on in one of the other uh, uh, presentations but I was not able to find that however you can find if you're a troller like I am and I troll deep for the big muscalunge of the lake every once in a while you'll hook into something that is enormous and uh, my daughter being a scuba diver I'm going to be sending her down to look at some of these enormous things uh, there are logs that are sitting on the bottom of the lake that are uh, in as good a shape as they were the, the day they were put on the lake, but uh, they were too heavy, they didn't float, and they sank. The other thing that happened is that we began to use the lake as a place to get rid of things that we didn't want anymore. And uh, we'll talk more about that during the, when we discuss the steamboat history, because uh, we basically burned an awful lot of boats out in the lake, and some of the scuba divers are now telling us tales of going down on the, the decks of some of these vessels in, in various parts of the lake. Fishing, yes. Transportation, yes. Recreation, well, it depends upon how you want to interpret fishing as to whether or not uh, Chautauqua Lake was used during this time as very much of a recreational asset. Uh, my sense is that 
uh, the people that were out there fishing were fishing because they needed the fish. It wasn't to get away and, and have a nice afternoon or, or a nice week as some of us have the, the privilege of having now. These people were working day and night for survival uh, during this period of time. Realize that other things are happening and are causing people to leave Chautauqua County and leave the Chautauqua Lake watershed. Uh, we have the United States filling to its, its continental size in the 1850s. We have the Oklahoma land rush, the Kansas land rush. We have the, the California gold rush, and people just kind of go zip through the county. We also have a number of religious organizations that come and spend a time here and move on, including the Mormons. Uh, it's an exciting time. It's a much slower time. I don't think I want to go back to the good old days uh, that this would describe. The uh, people are, are in many instances involved in subsistence living. The people that are able to uh, produce a product, uh, I think the best reading that you can find, particularly for Chautauqua Lake, is to read uh, Hazel Times records of the town of Ellicott. And then uh, we've, we've got an author up in the north end of the lake that's just starting to describe some of the history of of the village of Mayville in more detail than it has been in the, in the past, and that's uh, Devin Taylor. Uh, but you've, you've got to read and then you've got to transport yourself back and say, what was happening there and are those really the good old days and are you really ready to go back to them? I'm not. I, I think it was, it was a tremendously difficult existence. The years of high rain, uh, the lake functioned uh, many more weeks than it did in the years of, of low precipitation. And we'll get into that question of precipitation and how it plays a role uh, in the life of the lake and, and the use of the lake. The number of people that were involved in, in the area at this time were growing by leaps and bounds. In fact, the population during this period of time was growing faster than Chautauqua County has grown in the last three decades. We're talking about some decades adding as many as 10,000 people to the county population. Uh, the censuses of 1855, I sat and read them, and of course, you can read them up in the courthouse if you're allowed to find them. Uh, and it gives not only the man and the wife, but what they do, and in some instances, it also gives you a complete write-up of the uh, livestock that they have on the farm. It depends upon what, what uh, township you're in and what, that you, you get that type of census information. But basically, we're working with a very difficult time. We're talking about a place that uh, basically around the shores of the lake, there are no public water supplies. Everybody has to develop their own water supply. Everybody must develop their own waste disposal method or system. In a number of instances, uh, the best of the farmland is that land that the Indians had used as farmland. And realize in 1850 to 1860, the German scientists finally begin to discover and tell us about nutrients and their importance in the growth of plants. And all of a sudden, we don't have to burn and, and cut and slash and raise crops and move on. We now begin to understand that we can replenish the land and have it continue to pr produce at a, a good level over an extended period of time. Uh, prior to this, uh, basically, we did an awful lot of burning and slashing and moving on when the land uh, would stop uh, producing the crops that we wanted them to. In terms of fishery, uh, I haven't read Norton's notes, the Norton brothers or father and son notes, back far enough to know whether or not they have good records. Uh, in later times, we have daily reports of the fish that are taken from the lake. And, and what they mean to the local economy. But up through 1860, I, I don't recall any good notes. There's some listings that are made of, of the fish that are in the lake, but they're not very scientific. They're basically somebody uh, making an observation about this, that, or the other thing. It's, it's nothing that I can put into a, a comparative sense. The depth of the lake, there is, in the VFW in Mayville, there is a map that supposedly was done in 18, or 1938 that shows a depth of the lake at more than 90 feet. 
When we did some later work, we could not find a 90-foot depth in the lake. And some people have spoken about the fact that the lake is silting in. And some people have suggested that it's silting in at an accelerating rate. I would suggest to you that the accelerating rate took place starting with the first lumbering by European man in the watershed. And that rate of siltation increased up until the 30s when we began to recognize that the watershed of the lake had property and, and certain soil areas that you could not produce a good subsist even a good subsistence farming activity. And we began to see the state come in and buy lands, and we began to see the county buy lands, the state reforestation lands, because the only product that could be raised on them would be a forest product. And so from that time on, the rate of siltation from the general watershed uh, begins to uh, decrease. But the greatest increase of that rate took place from this time of 18, or 1749 uh, to 1860, when the, as far as I am concerned, uh, they, they basically took every piece of wood that they could exchange for some kind of dollar, cents, or service they took. And that's as far as I can go with this period of time.